This lecture considers child nutrition in the context of low- and middle-income countries. Child nutrition is increasingly recognized as one of the most important contributors to the intergenerational persistence of poverty. It is therefore an important social justice topic and one that has gained more prominence over the last year as the pandemic has created greater concerns about hunger and food security. As the overview shows, we will cover five themes within this broader topic of child nutrition. 1. Why does child nutrition matter? Why do and should we care about this? 2. How do we assess adequate child nutrition? How do we measure whether a child is well nourished? And what are the challenges to such measures? How do we measure impact on nutrition? 3. Social determinants of nutrition. What are the pathways through which poverty and disadvantage influence undernutrition and undernourishment? 4. What does this mean? Where does this leave us? What are the implications of this? What do we know? And what do we not know? 5. What can we do? What are the policies and interventions that we know work and are affordable? What are the most important things that we do not know that need to be addressed? We will start this lecture with this first bullet, asking why child nutrition matters. The most important pathway for nutrition is via its impact on education and via education, its impact on labor market earnings. For adults, nutrition has an immediate but temporary impact on productivity and a long-term impact on health. However, for children, it can have long-lasting effects because it can affect their cognitive development and their education or schooling performance. Specifically, nutrients such as calcium, protein, and iron are vital for children's physical growth. Also, nutrients such as vitamins A and C, minerals such as iodine, are pivotal for reducing morbidity. Furthermore, iron, protein, iodine, and fat are essential for children's brain development. There is both a direct and indirect effect of nutrition on schooling and cognitive development via an increasing yield on schooling performance. These effects are often tightly interwoven and difficult to separate in empirical work. This flow diagram provides a fuller and more comprehensive view of the pathways through which nutrition influences human development and social welfare. The first important distinction here is the difference between the adequacy of the quantity and quality of nutrition. Many of you already know that increasingly, with the rise of cheap and widely available processed food, it is the quality of nutrition rather than the quantity that is the greatest policy concern. So we distinguish between both these pathways, hunger and nutrition deficiency. We also acknowledge the role of nutrient absorption through, for instance, repeated instances of diarrhea that can deplete gut microbes. Hunger and nutrition deficiency can have both an immediate and a long-term, LT, effect. The short-term, ST, impact is via energy, mood, and concentration, but also immunity, recovery from illness, and its complementary effect on the effectiveness of treatment. The long-term effect is via chronic illness, being overweight or underweight, stunting, cognitive development, and mental health. These effects have a substantial impact on morbidity, mortality, cognitive development, and also more broadly, mental health and well-being. Such effects can be captured via life expectancy or more encompassing measures accounting for the health and quality of life. The latter includes health-adjusted life expectancy, H-A-L-E, disability-adjusted life years, D-A-L-Y-S, and quality-adjusted life years, Q-A-L-Y-S. The latter two are measures that are used to represent and compare outcomes in cost-effectiveness studies. Nutrition also has knock-on effects that manifest in a decrease in in-school and or out-of-school learning outcomes. We have already covered the well-known pathway via schooling and the labor market, but it is important to understand that nutrition will also affect knowledge retention and information, and thus decision-making in other contexts, not just in schools. 
Some of this learning and cognitive processing effects can also occur via out-of-school learning and can also yield benefits outside the school labor market nexus. It can, for instance, influence health literacy, which will, in turn, determine high-impact life and health choices, such as reproductive decisions. These pathways are important because they tend to perpetuate and entrench poverty and privilege, which will impact social justice, equality, and social cohesion. Also, nutrition matters because it can perpetuate current distributions of poverty and privilege and work against social mobility. The pathways for this operate via both income and information. Both parental income and parental nutritional information will affect food choices. This may thus inhibit nutrition and food diversity, which will affect the health, development, and growth of the child, and along this pathway contribute to an intergenerational persistence in poverty and poor health. Research has shown that these effects persist and affect labor market income. There are many market failures in nutritional choices that would provide a rationale for government involvement in child nutrition. These reasons include the inequity that means many poor households cannot afford to buy a healthy, balanced, and sufficient basket of food. Additionally, lower maternal education is linked to having less information about nutrition and the impact of nutrition, which will affect nutritional choices. Due to the informational asymmetries, markets are not rewarded for providing healthy food, but rather for providing food that tastes good. Lastly, there is benefits to public interventions, especially early interventions, because of the health and productivity externalities of nutrition, especially in the early years. This takes care of the why we care theme, which means we can move on to measurement, discussing how we know whether a child receives adequate nutrition. We start with anthropometric data, which is a vital source of information. Why is it so meaningful and important as a source of nutritional information? While genetics is an important determinant of being small or large at the individual level, it is unimportant at the population level. We know that populations with a high fraction of stunted children are populations where there is an evidence of nutritional deprivation. So a measure that is readily, widely, and easily captured is useful because we can learn a considerable amount from stunting statistics in particular. After all, it is associated with serious deprivations, including poor health, impaired brain development, and higher mortality risk. There are three key anthropometric measures. The first is stunting, which captures a child's height for weight asking whether a specific child or the children of a specific subpopulation tend to be shorter than normal. Because stunting is cumulative, these indicators capture chronic malnutrition. The second is wasting, which captures weight for height, examining whether a child or group of children are thinner than normal. Because children's weight can fluctuate, this is seen as a measure of acute undernourishment. Lastly, there is underweight, represented by weight for age. This indicator considers whether children are thinner than normal, which again is a measure of acute undernourishment. With the advent of cheap processed food, the focus has shifted to stunting. Due to the easier access to processed food, fullness and calories are no longer such a challenge, and we have seen a reduction in the prevalence of children who are wasting and who are underweight. However, this means very little because due to processed food, kids now are often within the normal weight ranges but still suffer from serious nutritional shortages and developmental issues. Due to the nutritional transition, wasting and underweight indicators have become less influential as measures of health. We must talk in more detail about how we assess children's anthropometric status. These evaluations are comparative and made with reference to international standards of children in a well-nourished reference population. The cutoffs for wasting, underweight, stunting are based on two standard deviations away from the reference population's median weight for age, weight for height, or height for age. See graph at the bottom of the slide. 
Here you can see how one would, for instance, assess the prevalence of wasting in a specific population with respect to a reference population on the right-hand side. Note that the reference population used is a U.S. population, but due to controversy, this has been replaced in 2006 by a multi-centered reference group compliant with good health behavior, such as no smoking and exclusive breastfeeding. Due to the focus on a subsample compliant with good behavior, the introduction of the new reference group led to an increase in stunting wasting scores by comparison. A z-score for an individual is calculated by taking the particular measurement of a child, say their weight for height, then deducting the reference group's median from it and dividing it by the standard deviation of the reference group. While there is some use for such individual level monitoring to identify and flag children who are at risk and need attention, for research purposes these indicators are used at the population or subpopulation level to examine the prevalence of wasting, stunting, etc., such as indicated by the weight for height distribution on the left hand side. This graph shows that the largest share of the distribution falls below the cutoff of two standard deviations below the median, and thus would be classified as wasted. As an example of how we calculate the z-scores, we can consider a 12-month-old girl who weighs 7.2 kilograms. In the reference sample, the median weight for 12-month-old girls is 9.5 kilograms and the standard deviation is 1. How would we calculate the z-score for this girl's weight? Press next slide so that animation shows answer. The z-score is calculated by deducting the median weight for the reference group and dividing it by the standard deviation of 1 to give us negative 2.3. This shows us that the girl is underweight because she is more than two standard deviations from the median weight for a girl her age. The data that we need for deriving anthropometric indicators are available from nutritional surveys, household surveys, as well as the demographic and health surveys. The prominence and importance of the goal of adequate nutrition is clear from its inclusion in the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 2 requires an end to hunger. It is broken up into Goal 2.1 that focuses on hunger and access for all to nutritious, safe, and sufficient food all year round, and Goal 2.2 that considers malnutrition. It is interesting to examine how these goals are tracked because this connects to our question of how we measure nutrition. Hunger is tracked using two measures, prevalence of undernourishment and moderate or severe food insecurity, as measured on the Food Insecurity Experience Scale. The prevalence of undernourishment is an estimate of the proportion of the population whose habitual food consumption is insufficient to provide the dietary energy levels that are required to maintain a normal, active, and healthy life. It is expressed as a percentage. Here we see a graph showing a few regional averages tracked over the past two decades. We see improvements in the prevalence of undernourishment, POU, especially for sub-Saharan African countries and East Asia. But most likely with COVID and the economic slowdown, we would have seen some reversal of these gains. This graph shows progress with food security in different regions. The indicator is based on the Food Insecurity Experience Scale Survey Module. The questions refer to the experiences of the individual respondent or of the respondent's household as a whole. The questions focus on self-reported food-related behaviors and experiences associated with increasing difficulties in accessing food due to resource constraints. The survey asks respondents eight questions. During the last 12 months, was there a time when, because of lack of money or other resources, 1. You were worried you would not have enough food to eat. 2. You were unable to eat healthy and nutritious food. 3. You ate only a few kinds of foods. 4. You had to skip a meal. 5. You ate less than you thought you should. 6. Your household ran out of food. 7. You were hungry but did not eat. And 8. You went without eating for a whole day. What is very clear in this graph, as well as the previous one, 
is the share of the hunger problem that is still regionally located on the African continent. Goal 2.2 considers malnourishment and this goal is tracked via the prevalence of stunting, wasting and overweight children under five years of age. This slide shows 2016 stunting levels for children under five years of age worldwide. Using a heat map where orange is 15 to 30 percent, red is 30 to 50 percent. The graph makes it clear once again that this is disproportionately an African problem, and in this case also a South Asian problem with the overall coloring of these areas of the map being dark orange and red. This graph shows the share of children aged 2 to 4 years of age who are overweight for the 10 largest developing countries observed between 2006 and 2016. While there are some countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh and Mexico that are bucking the trend, Overall, we observe a relatively steep and concerning upward trend, especially seeing that it shows a fairly short period of 10 years. We explore the concept of undernourishment in a bit more depth to see the challenges with measuring this accurately. As mentioned before, it is defined as the share of the population which is unable to meet dietary energy requirements, but we will explore the complexity of these judgments in the next few slides. The easier part of this calculation is the capturing of levels of food intake. Several studies capture food intake using a food diary, or otherwise recall, and such surveys then enable the estimation of both calories consumed and the quality of diet. They usually also include the food intake of children. Examples of such surveys in low and middle income countries include demographic and health surveys and multiple indicator cluster surveys. These surveys have enough detail to allow us to estimate 2008 WHO, UNICEF, infant and young child feeding indicators. However, DHS and MICS do not consistently collect consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, SSB, or unhealthy snacks, junk food, among children. We can use food intake surveys to estimate whether children are meeting their dietary energy requirement. But the question is, how do we know what is enough energy? It is difficult to estimate an individual's energy requirements because energy requirements depend on age, gender, and the individual's activity level. Even if taking into account systematic variation, it will not be enough because there is also an issue of further variation based on metabolic rates, and then energy requirements also vary over time within individuals. Additionally, it is important to acknowledge that not all calories are created equally. It is not just energy that matters, but nutrients. It is not an issue of staying alive, but thriving. Nutrients are essential for brain development and growth. The nutrition transition has changed nutrition problems and priorities because it changed the composition of diets with large increases in cheaper and accessible processed and semi-processed foods. This has led to a decrease in underweight kids, but stunting and undernourishment remain a problem. To give a sense of how food quality is measured, we look at two infant and young child feeding indicators, minimum dietary diversity and minimum acceptable diet indicators. Minimum dietary diversity captures the proportion of children 6 to 23 months of age who receive foods from five or more food groups from the total eight groups. The eight groups are breast milk, grains, roots and tubers, legumes and nuts, dairy products, flesh foods, eggs, vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, and other fruits and vegetables. The minimum acceptable diet indicator measures the proportion of children 6 to 23 months of age who receive a minimum acceptable diet it includes both the minimum dietary diversity, but adds to this a minimum meal frequency which is dependent on age and whether the child is breastfed or not. Deaton and Drez's 2019 paper considers the puzzle of India and why there have been income increases and a decrease in poverty, but without reductions in undernutrition and stunting. They make two important points. Firstly, that there is not a tight link between incomes and calories consumed. People don't necessarily prioritize food. 
Similarly, there is not a tight link between calories consumed and nutrition. Calories are as important as what type of food is consumed, especially fruit and vegetables, and calorie needs would depend on the individual's activity levels, access to clean water, sanitation, hygiene practices, and vaccinations. A continued focus on wasting and underweight indicators may hide that many kids could still lack vital micronutrients and cause us to miss ongoing problems with child health and stunting. Child obesity is rising in most countries, also due to nutrition transition, and it is important to pay more attention to this issue too. Obesity contributes significantly to the burden of disease through its association with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and asthma. The second component of measurement is how we establish impact. It is vital for policy making that we distinguish correlations from causal relationships. From the perspective of policy making, there is a large and important difference between saying good nutrition and school level attainment are correlated and saying that good nutrition improves school level attainment. A correlation could indicate a relationship between two variables, but it could be that B is affecting A, or that A is affecting B. It could also be that both these statements are true and the relationship runs in both directions, that the A affects B and B also affects A. The existence of a correlation provides no information on the direction of the relationships. It could even be that both variables may be related to and reacting to the same underlying C. This is a very important distinction to keep in mind when you are reading articles in this field, because most studies on health that consider nutrition have not taken into account endogeneity. It may arguably be the worst when it comes to the field of stunting research. Many studies are estimating the economic impact of stunting but reliant on flawed methodology that cannot confidently and accurately establish causal relationships. Endogeneity is a substantial concern when it comes to nutrition and stunting, because in many cases we may be worried that statistical relationships between variables could be attributable to some factor that we cannot observe, which could lead to both stunting and worse outcomes in adulthood. There may be, for instance, a relationship between stunting and wages, but this statistical association does not mean that stunting causes lower wages. It could be the case that those who received higher relative household investments of time and resources are both less likely to be stunted and more likely to have higher wages. The problem is therefore that a correlation may be an overestimate of the causal relationship or may even suggest an effect when there is none. The ideal hypothetical study design to estimate the causal effect of stunting is an experimental study or a randomized control trial, RCT. In an ideal scenario, if ethics or feasibility were of no concern and we were just worried about the quality of evidence and scientific rigor, children would be randomly allocated to be stunted or to be normal height for age. But this is neither feasible nor ethical for stunting or wasting. Research on breastfeeding faces similar challenges, that it cannot be randomized due to ethical concerns, and this explains why there is a lack of causal evidence available for this topic as well. The closest we get to random allocation in this high-stakes field of nutrition is the random allocation of nutritional interventions. One of the most frequently cited studies in this field is a Guatemalan nutrition RCT by John Hottenot and his co-authors. The RCT involved a protein boost given to two of four villages in 1969 and 1977. Two of the villages were given a nutritious supplement called Atoll, a drink made from Incaparino, a vegetable protein mixture, dried skim milk, and sugar that provided 6.4 grams of protein. In the other two villages, residents were given Fresco, a drink that contains no protein. The supplements were available to all villagers twice daily throughout the study at a central location in each village. These individuals were re-surveyed from 2002 to 2004. The long-term follow-up studies found that the supplements increased wages by 46% for men but there was no significant effect for women. 
Also, it increased household expenditure and decreased the probability of living in poverty in adulthood. However, the study was reliant on village-level randomization, and there were only four villages, so we cannot rule out that these observed differences may be due to random chance or unobserved heterogeneity. Similarly, there was an adult iron supplement RCT in Indonesia. It was called the WISE study and was conducted by a large group of researchers, including Duncan Thomas and others. At the baseline, male rubber workers were recruited into the study, tested for anemia, and then randomized to receive either an iron supplement or a placebo. They found that the treatment had a significant impact on iron deficiency anemia and increased yearly earnings for self-employed workers who got the supplement and were anemic at baseline. The anemic workers were 20% less productive than the non-anemic workers, with productivity measured in terms of the latex collected. The anemic workers who received the iron supplements improved their productivity so that they were now almost performing on the level of the non-anemic workers. The study seemed to be very cost-effective because the $40 increase in yearly earnings was achieved via a fortified fish sauce which cost $6 for a year's supply. There was, however, concerns about self-selection via attrition. Of the 156 workers enrolled in the study at the start, only 77 were still part of the study at the end line, and the concern would be that those who received the iron supplements, those who received a benefit, would be more likely to stay engaged and positive about the study and be retained as part of the sample, while those who experienced little benefit may be more likely to exit the study. A school-based deworming RCT in rural Kenya by Michael Kremer and his colleagues showed that parasites like worms can cause poor nutrition absorption, for example, iron deficiency and anemia. The researchers found that the children who received two to three additional years of deworming experienced an increase of 14% in consumption expenditure and a 13% increase in hourly wages. The treatment is very cost-effective at 65 U.S. cents per treatment. Alberto Chong and his co-authors experimented with media messages about iron supplementation in high schools in Peru. Their RCT found that formerly anemic students exposed to treatment were 34% less likely to be anemic and had 21% higher cognitive scores. It had a moderate effect on schooling and also improve their aspirations for the future. In the past decade, especially in the last five years, there's been an increase in nutritional nudges where behavioral economics findings have been used to design lightweight interventions to improve nutrition. This is an apt application for behavioral economics because in many cases, individuals want to eat better and know what to do, but find it notoriously difficult to change behavior. Behavioral economists use the anomalies in how we think and act to help align our daily actions with our intentions and long-term goals. Often the involvement of behavioral economists in policy making is called libertarian paternalism because on the one hand it values freedom of choice, but on the other hand it also recognizes the importance of influencing choices towards a social optimum. Caderio and Chandon's 2019 paper provided a systematic review of 96 nutritional nudges to reduce overnutrition and obesity. They distinguished three categories, cognitive nudges, affective nudges, and behavioral nudges. Cognitive nudges would include nutritional labeling, for example, more information or a traffic light system using emoticons to signal healthy choices and visibility enhancement, for example, prominent product placement at eye level or at the checkout area. Effective nudges would include healthy eating calls, for example, suggestions from waiters, and pleasure appeals, for example, visually appealing displays, while behavioral nudges would be convenience enhancements, for example, fruit and vegetables at default, and size enhancements, example, larger portion sizes for healthy foods smaller portions for unhealthy foods. Considered from an obesity and overeating perspective, they concluded that behavioral nudges work best, saving 320 calories on average, 
versus 129 to 172 calories for effective nudges and 54 to 91 calories for cognitive nudges. They do not, however, take the comparative cost and effort of each of these types of nudges into account. There is an increasing base of evidence on the long-lasting effects of a mother's prenatal health and nutrition. Some recent RCT studies have contributed to this knowledge including a Tanzanian RCT by Erica Field and her co-authors to provide iodine supplementations to pregnant women. They found that students who were in utero when and where these supplements were distributed had higher educational achievement. Also, the treated children attained an estimated 0.35 to 0.56 years of additional schooling relative to siblings, slightly older and slightly younger children, where the pregnancy did not coincide with the distribution of these supplements. Although not fully covered here, it is important to mention that there are other pre-birth influences that have a lasting effect on children, including environmental factors such as poor sanitation and water quality, which can, amongst other things, affect nutrient absorption. Some of these pathways also affect mental and physical health. Quasi-experimental studies use natural experiments, such as exposure to famines, to estimate causal effects of early life events on later outcomes. Such events are likely to affect nutrition and can be as good as randomly assigned. This is because exposure to natural disasters is not related to any characteristics of the children or their families. Most of these studies estimate the effects of shocks in utero rather than in early childhood. However, there are also some concerns about this stream of work. Firstly, often natural disasters are situated at the extreme end of the human experience and are quite rare. For instance, famine involves extreme nutritional deprivation. It is not clear that the effects of such extreme deprivation would necessarily extend to less extreme undernutrition. Also, we cannot rule out the possibility that other factors may have played a role. Famines caused by war and exposure to war may have caused parental stress, which could also potentially have affected children's outcomes. Although effects observed can be interpreted as causal, these effects are not necessarily those of poor nutrition alone. As the figure shows, a household's food availability will be determined by the relative importance of nutrition in the household and their nutritional knowledge, as well as prices, overall budget, and access to food. Some of these factors affect each other. Once food has been purchased, the allocation of food within the household will be determined based on the negotiating power within the household. The rest of the flow diagram is a simplified version of the one shown earlier outlining how food choices affect functioning in the short term and health outcomes over the long term. There is not much evidence of a large-scale poverty trap if we are only looking at quantity of food. It is increasingly clear that there is a need to focus not only on the quantity of food and calories. It's not how much you consume, but what you consume that matters. What is valuable is the quality of foods and nutrients. We need to care not only about acute hunger, but also about hidden hunger due to lack of nutrients. This is important because it has an impact on how we monitor and address malnutrition. The puzzle around India's rapid income growth and falling food consumption shows that rising incomes and grants are imperfect solutions. We need to intervene in a more targeted way. Despite increases in per capita consumption and declines in poverty, Indians are spending less on food than they did 30 years ago, and there is still widespread child undernourishment, anemia, and one in five Indian children are suffering from wasting. In her 2011 paper, Pascaline Dupas considers explanations for the lack of long-term investments in health in developing countries. The structure of these explanations are also a good framework to consider why households may not always make optimal nutritional choices. First, there are prohibitive prices. The evidence on unwillingness of poor households to pay for fortified food 
has shown that prices do matter, and even small increases in costs for much healthier food can be prohibitive. Secondly, preferences also matter, and it is vital to understand that people are not robots and make food choices not simply based on the nutritional value of the food and the productivity that the food will yield, so just based on the utility of it, but also the enjoyment and the taste of food plays a role in choices of foods. Due to the general tendency for impatience in valuing the current situation, many individuals may place the immediate prospect of enjoyment topmost and give less consideration to the long-term effects of healthy eating. Additionally, we know that decisions on household budgets are made alongside other budgetary needs. There cannot be any assumption that food would enjoy a special status or protection. It is affected by competing expenditures such as buying a TV or attending social events. Thirdly, nutritional choices may be impeded by a lack of knowledge and information and therefore it is vital that public campaigns are launched to improve information and labeling and to inform household decision makers so that they understand the nutritional value of food and specifically the tremendous impact of nutrition on the life prospects of their children and productivity of the adults in the household. Examples of cost-effective policies with a substantial impact include deworming, micronutrient supplements, biofortified food crops, sugar taxes, and school meals. Grants are too blunt to be a cost-effective strategy. Empirical work and the Indian experience have showed a low child nutrition response from growth measures, suggesting that we need a more targeted approach to improve nutrition.